-hmm. That's how I sort of view this, is that mm -hmm. Ophelia's speech, whether or not it's meaningless as they attribute it to her, not that I'm attributing that necessarily myself, but even if it were meaningless, even something that starts off as just, you know, her dancing, her performing of this madness, her performing these ballads in a context in which they are not meant to be performed, because in this context they are frightening. I think that that sort of chaos is what I mean by this. And that could grow into political unrest. That could grow into sort of this chaos in others. And when you have this, I mean, you, you have Denmark, which is rotten in this case. And I think you chance through a vehicle such as Ophelia, in their opinion, you can chance something happening to the whole state, to the whole state of things that is as uneasy as Hamlet's ghost walking. And I think there is something in these performing bodies that are very much physical in here that is more frightening even than having Hamlet's ghost out and about. Mm -hmm. um, but also, if you were attributing, as I usually am <laughs> want to do, attributing sort of consciousness in Ophelia's performance, then yes, it could be incredibly subversive. Um, she's talking about um, she's talking about societal implications of um, sexuality before marriage, which could have a huge weight on you know her relationship with Hamlet. She's talking about um, the ways in which we mourn. At one point um, in the ballads, um, she sings, "At his head a grass green turf, and at his heels a stone." This kind of suggests an inversion of things. I see that as like a burial stone, which should be at his head, being at his feet. And everything she speaks to speaks of inversion, transformativity, her part, they say the owl was a baker's daughter, it's certainly, there's transformation happening in her speech, and there's something that could unseat the norm of things, I guess, even with the chaos of how she pieces them together. So, I think um, definitely if you look at um, around line 47, the ballad Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day. I really think that this could be an example of these multiple voices, of these multiple perspectives, um, especially the female perspective, which I think is incredibly important in ballads, in that it allows us to investigate the female response to these masculine influences. Um, so when you hear Ophelia, for instance, saying, quoth he before, uh, she before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed, he answers, so would I done by yonder sun, and thou hadst not come to my bed. So you see, you have this very um, sort of masculine shaping of the world in this promise mm -hmm. um, to wed the woman after he sleeps with her, but because she is caught in this sort of masculine catch-22 of sorts, mm -hmm. she, is, she cannot possibly fulfill all the roles she has to fulfill in this situation um, in order for this to play in her favor. And I think that's crucial when you're looking at Ophelia. Ophelia has had to deal with so many outside influences at this point. She has had to deal with Polonius' advice, telling her all the things she has to do perfectly in order to possibly wed Hamlet or to keep him away if he has no intention of marriage. She has Laertes telling her advice. She has all the court trying to shape her interactions with Hamlet because supposedly he's lovesick. She has all these people and voices telling her a thousand things that she cannot possibly fulfill that are as ridiculous as this ballad, as this sort of appeasement of a man that she can never possibly appease because in doing what she has had to do to get what she's been promised, she has voided that promise. And I think Ophelia's madness, in the way I view it, it's her sort of channeling all of these almost outraged, absurd, strange bits of society through her because she has seen the strangeness in society itself and it is no more weird and no more shocking than a ballad and yet no one else seems to want to discuss that and no one else wants to process in this way because it is low. But what has been done to her can only be expressed in this way that is fragmentary, in this way that cannot possibly, um, that's like contradictory, because that is what her life has been to this point. I think as well that it's incredibly important when we're considering Ophelia's performance of ballads, we remember that it's a very embodied performance, and if you even look at how the gentleman introduces this performance as well, 
She speaks much of her father, says she hears there's tricks in the world, and hems and beats her heart, spurns enviously at straws. Um, so this hemming, this beating of her heart, this running around, this handing of flowers, she is fully channeling this performance. She is not restraining herself in any way. Her body is essentially performing the same things she is singing about. She is singing about a uh, sort of very embodied matter. She's singing about sexuality. She's singing about dead bodies. She's singing about things that are grounded in the physical. And the physicality of ballads as well is something that places it in this sort of suspect, I think, genre for early modern England because it addresses all these things in our bodies that perhaps we are we would not comfortably deal with.